couple of weeks ago I saw the new Top Gun film and I really enjoyed it. If you get the chance I definitely recommend going to have a look at it. But it inspired me to try some jet VFX of my own. First we're going to model a fighter jet. First we're going to download a jet from Sketchfab and load it into Blender. This model has the landing gear down which I don't want so I'm going to delete the wheels and supports then reposition some of the panels in edit mode to make it look like the landing gear has been retracted. It's not perfect but for a high speed flyby shot it's good enough. If you want a better result then paying for a high quality model from somewhere like TurboSquid is definitely the way to go. Next we're going to add the footage. I'm using 4K ProRes HQ from my Red Komodo but any 4K and above 422 video files should be fine. I haven't properly graded the footage, but I did convert it to Rec. 709 using Dehancer, and there's an affiliate code in the description for 10% off if you want to buy it. I also did a quick white balance adjustment and slightly lowered the highlights and overall exposure. A bit of a tip for when you're shooting the footage. If you're going to be moving the camera a lot or quite quickly, like I was in this shot, then I recommend increasing your shutter speed or decreasing your shutter angle, depending on how your camera is set up. Uh, I went with a 90 degree shutter angle because I wanted a reasonably crisp looking video but still like a little hint of motion blur. The Red Komodo that I'm using has a global shutter which was also very helpful. I'm going to make sure to save the project and then we can move on to motion tracking. I'm going to add a new motion tracking tab which can be found in the VFX menu. Then I'm going to load in the first shot. Click set scene frames to set the length of the project to be the same as the video clip. I'm also going to click prefetch to load the clip into RAM and make the playback a bit faster. Next we're going to start adding tracking markers. By clicking add, then clicking the point on the footage where you'd like to place the tracker. Then command or control T to track forwards, shift command or control T to track backwards. If the tracking marker wanders off the point you've chosen, you can reposition it and then track forwards or backwards again. The section where the camera does the whip pan is the hardest part to track, so that's where I'm going to spend most of my time trying to find a good place to position the tracking markers. Auto detect features sadly doesn't really help me much with this shot. To make my life a little bit easier, I'm going to enable the search radius box so I can see how far Blender will look when it's trying to move the tracker between frames. If the point on the footage moves outside of the search area, then the tracking marker is guaranteed to fail. I've also unchecked show disabled, so tracking markers will only appear when they're active. If a tracking marker is continuing to be active, even after the section of footage you're tracking has left the screen, you can click on one of the clear tracking marker buttons to disable the track after the current frame. There's an option to clear the track before the current frame or after the current frame, depending on which way you're tracking through the footage. At this point, I ran into a pretty big issue. No matter what I tried, I just couldn't get the tracking markers to stick during the fast camera pan. So I decided that I would go and reshoot the footage, except this time I lowered my shutter angle from 90 degrees down to 22.5 degrees. Now, I could have edited this out of the tutorial, but I figured it would be useful to leave in any mistakes I make so you can see what I've done and you can hopefully avoid making them. If you're in the same position as me, but you can't reshoot the footage, I'd try and reposition the camera so that the jet's out of the top of the frame, and then you can just track the beginning and the end of the shot separately. It's a trick that I've used before on stubborn background replacements. The new clip is much easier to motion track. Auto detect features finds way more points at the beginning and end of the clip. I managed to find a few points during the camera pan that would track. Although because of how fast the camera movement is, the tracking markers required a lot of manual intervention. I did have some issues when I set the search area for the tracking markers too big. I hoped a larger search area wouldn't need as much tracker repositioning, but the trackers ended up wandering off too much, so I had to set off for doing a lot of the work manually. Once you've got a good range of tracking markers, you can have a go at solving the camera move. The keyframes option allows you to tell the camera solver where you want it to focus for camera movement analysis. I've checked auto keyframe so that Blender can figure out on its own where to put the keyframes. Immediately you can see a problem. Only the section in the middle of a shot has enough tracking markers. You always need 8 tracking markers at one time. They need to be overlapping. It's kind of difficult to explain, so we're just going to add more tracking markers until the camera solve works. If you're still having problems, like I am, 
then you can deselect auto keyframe and instead try setting the keyframes manually. Ideally, you want to aim for 30 frames between the A and B value. But in this case, I doubt that will be possible. So I'm going to slowly adjust the keyframe values whilst adding more markers until everything solves. The camera movement seems to have solved properly and with an error value of 1.55 pixels, which is actually not bad. A solve error of less than one would be ideal. So we're going to play around and see if we can get that value down a little bit but we do have something that is usable. So before we start messing around with anything, we're going to save another version of this blend file just in case we completely break it. First, I'm going to enable the refine options for focal length, optical center, and radial distortion. This gets us down to a 1.5 solve error. Then in the clip display, I'm going to enable the tracking info and have a look at the tracking graph at the bottom of the screen. I'm looking for any tracking markers that stand out. If any look odd, I click on them, Watch them back and see if they jump around all over the place. And if they do, I delete them, especially if they have a solve error higher than 1.5. And that gets the solve error down to 1.2 pixels. I repeated the same tracking marker selection process and I managed to get the solve error down to 1.18. I tried doing this a few more times, but then I ran into the issue of not having enough tracking markers, which could cause the solve error to increase or sometimes the camera solve would just not work at all. With a bit of undoing and experimenting around, I got the solve error down to 0.87. I'll take that. Next, I'm going to find two tracking markers in a position that makes it easy to tell how far apart they are, enter the distance between them, and then hit set scale and apply scale. Then I'm going to click set up tracking scene. There are more options you can use to try and orientate your scene properly, and they might work with a more ideal shot. But in this case, I think it's going to be easier to do most of the work myself. Now we're going to go into the viewport, enable motion tracking overlays and scale them down a bit to see what monstrosity we have created. The panning motion looks all right, but the camera does seem to have a bit of a list going on at the end of the shot. Time to save the project as a new version once again. First thing first, the viewport playback isn't great. The high res 4K clip probably isn't helping. It's great for motion tracking, but really not for playback. So I'm going to go back into Resolve and export the clip out again, but this time at 1080p, and then switch that clip into the camera's background image. And now the project's playing back perfectly. So let's try and fix some of these motion tracking issues. First, I'm going to select two different points, guess the difference and click set scale. The points look a bit more sensibly sized now. I'm going to scale the camera back to around one and then reposition it in the middle of the screen. Then I'm going to add a plane and scale it so it's roughly the same shape as the road. Then reposition the camera until the edge of the road matches up with the road in the footage. Make sure that the background image is set to front and you can also play around with the opacity as well. The road looks pretty well placed. Well, from the start of the shot at least. Now I could try and mess around adding and removing points and resolving the camera track, but the shaking of the camera looks pretty good. It's just the pan in the middle of the shot is throwing everything off. Time for some cheating. Add an empty and move it to the end of the camera. Parent the camera to the empty using the without inverse option. I've no idea what that parent mode does, but it didn't move the camera when I tried it, so we're going to use it. Find the frame where the camera movement starts to wander off, go a couple of frames back, and then add a rotation keyframe. Find the keyframe where the camera finishes wandering around, and then rotate the empty so that the road is in the correct position, and then add another rotation keyframe. It's not perfect, but it looks much better. Next, I'm going to add another keyframe in between the two current ones and I'm gonna rotate the empty to try and just cancel out that upwards tilt that's happening in the middle of a shot. And this is now looking pretty good. Now for the jet. Add a path and scale it up, and then in edit mode, reposition the points so that the path matches the route that you want the jet to fly. Add an empty and position it in the middle of a the jet, then parent the jet to the empty using the keep transform option. I'm going to call this empty jet empty because naming your meshes is important. Next, add a follow path constraint to the jet and select the path. Make sure the location of the empty is set to zero, otherwise it won't follow the path properly. 
Select follow curve and rotate the empty so that the jet is facing the right direction. Now we can add a keyframe to the offset value so that it's at zero at the start of the clip and then minus 100 or sometimes 100 at the end of the clip. Change the camera's background image from front to back so we can see what's going on in the scene. It's starting to look cool but there are still some issues. First, the jet is way too big, so scale it down a little bit. Then adjust the keyframes of the animation because right now the jet is flying past the camera too early. We can also change the animation type. Go to the animation page and then change one of the tabs to be a graph editor and then making sure the empty is selected, press T and choose linear. Another little keyframe adjustment and it's looking even better but at the end of the animation, that's not how planes are meant to turn. We want to make the plane perform a banked turn, so we're going to rotate the plane as it goes around the corner. But the rotate tool isn't doing what we want, so change the transform orientation from global to local. And now we can rotate the jet the way we want to. Just make sure that you change the transform mode back to global once you're done. I'm happy with the animation for now, so let's set up the render. I'm going to make sure the render engine is set to cycles, GPU compute is enabled, and that motion blur is also enabled. And then we can hit F12 to render out a frame. There are a few things that need fixing. First, in the compositing tab, I'm going to delete the nodes that the motion tracking panel added and replace them with a much simpler setup. All you need to do is add a movie clip and render layers, combine them with a mix node, and then plug the mix node into a viewer output and composite output node. Make sure you can see the jet render and not the background video clip. You may need to switch the order of the render layers and the movie clip node in the mix node's inputs if you can't see the jet. Then put the alpha from the render layers node into the mix node. It won't do anything yet, but it will be important later. Finally, enable transparent in the film section and render the scene again. You should now see the jet and the background video clip together in the viewer. I want a bit less motion blur so that the jet matches the low shutter angle that we had to shoot the footage at. I'm going to try 0 0.25 and I'm also going to disable the road so that it doesn't show up in the renders. Now to fix the lighting. The footage was shot with a mixture of cloudy and clear sky so we're going to go to Polyhaven and find an HDRI with a similar style sky and then download it. Back in Blender, open the shading tab and switch to the world texture. Add an environment texture and choose the HDRI that we just downloaded. We want to be able to rotate the texture so add a texture coordinate node and a mapping node. Plug the generated output from the texture coordinate node into the vector input of the mapping node, then connect the mapping node to the environment texture. We can have a look at what we've got in the rendered view, but if you want to be able to actually see the HDRI, not just the lighting effect, disable the transparent option in the film section. It looks pretty good, but I'm going to rotate the HDRI so the brightest section is more behind the camera because that's what the lighting was like when I shot the video. You can adjust the rotation of the HDRI with the Z rotation field in the mapping node. 20 degrees looks right to me. Then re-enable the transparent option and render another frame. Looks a little bit too dark, so increase the HDRI strength to 1.5. The jet looks a bit noisy, so I'm going to increase the maximum samples to 1000. Still a bit noisy, so again increase the max samples to 2500. The shot looks like it's ready to render, so I'm going to prepare it to upload it to a render farm. I'm going to plug the render layers node directly into the composite node, as I only want to render the jet. We'll composite everything together in DaVinci Resolve later. The only other thing I need to do is select File, External Data, automatically pack resources so that the textures are saved into the blend file. But we get a warning saying some of the files can't be found, probably because I've moved textures and blend files around as I've been working on the project, but this is an easy fix. Click File, External Data, Make Paths Relative, then File, External Data, Find Missing Files. Then just select the folder where the jet is and that should relink all the files. Saving the blend file again still gives us an error message saying that one file, test.png, can't be found, but it doesn't seem like the jet needs the file and I can't find it in the texture folder anyway, so it seems like we don't need it. And now we are ready to render out the project. I'm going to be using our own render farm Graded Blue Render Farm. Graded Blue Render Farm is very easy to use. All you need to access it is a web browser. All you need to do is upload a blend file or a zip archive containing your project and resources, 
confirm a couple of settings and start rendering. We're also one of the cheaper services, so if you want fast, reliable, affordable rendering, have a look at Greater Blue Render Farm. The link's down in the video description. I'm not going to go into detail about how I did the second shot. It's a very similar process to the first shot, except it's even easier because we don't have the big camera pan. Unfortunately though, the vigorous camera shake did upset the tracker a little bit and required some more manual intervention. The lighting also needs a bit of adjusting, so I rotated the HDRI so the sun was coming from the right direction. There was also too much green light hitting the bottom of the jet which was coming from the HDRI, so I added a large plane underneath the camera and the jet and gave it a brown colour to simulate light bouncing off the roofs of the houses. By adjusting the roughness, the brightness and the hue of the plane, I managed to get a gentle bounce light that looked pretty realistic. The lighting isn't perfect, but we can fix that in post. Oh, we're already in post. We'll recolor it in DaVinci Resolve later. Finally, the second shot can now be sent to the render farm. Now both shots have rendered, we can download them and bring them into DaVinci Resolve. After Effects or another compositing program like Nuke could also work. <laughs> If the frames aren't showing up properly, make sure that the frame display mode is set to sequence. With the playhead over the first clip, switch to fusion. Drag the panning shot into the node area and combine the two media in nodes with a merge. Next add a luma key and drag the output of media in one into the luma key's yellow input. Adjust the sliders at the top so that you can only see the sky and the rest is transparent. Then drag the output of a luma key into the input of media in 2. The jet will now look as if it's behind the hedge, but it's also behind every other tree as well. So create a new B-spline mask and draw around the hedge, then reposition it as the camera pans right. I'm also going to add a little bit of softness to the luma key. That looks much better. The last thing we're going to do in Fusion is add a color curves node just after media in 2 and experiment a bit with the contrast. Make sure to plug the output of media in 2 into both the yellow and blue inputs of the color curves so we're only affecting the jet. Then just repeat the process for the second clip. But with this clip, the jet was disappearing when I plugged the luma key node into the media in input. So I just plugged it into the blue input on the merge node and that worked as expected. I did also add a hue curves node so I could take some of the blue out of the jet. I'm going to add a bit of a stylistic look to the footage using Dehancer and I'm also going to add some denoising to the shots but I'll disable that for now so that we can still have real-time playback in the timeline. Now all we need to do is cut down the clips, add some jet sound effects that I found on Pixabay, and maybe add a little bit of rock music too. It might not be perfect, but I'm happy with the result. If I was going to do this project again, I would adjust the camera angle in the first shot a bit and move the path of the jet up so that it's above the large trees. And in the second shot, I would also scale down the jet because it looks a little bit oversized. I also think I might have overdone it a little bit with the camera shake. If you end up using this tutorial to make your own jet-inspired blender render, I'd love to see it, so put a link to your video in the comments section and I'll have a look at it. Yeah.